I will say, um, okay, cool. I'll also say uh, if you have questions, go ahead and, and ask and feel free to keep your video on. I, I've been teaching to a, a group of blank screens all year, so it's always <laughs> great to see faces. Um, yeah, so when, when we started the group, we were really interested in trying to understand memory and protein lipid interactions and using uh, native mass spectrometry and nanodisks to do this. Um, and then, you know, as we started to develop this project, we started to realize that some of the techniques we were developing could also be used to study other things. And so we kind of branched out and started to do some work on antimicrobial peptides and looking at how they oligomerize and assemble within membranes. And then um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we started to realize that there are these really interesting membrane proteins and viruses called viroporins. And it turns out that they're kind of a blend of these two different projects and that they're really small membrane proteins, but they oligomerize within membranes. And so we wanted to understand kind of how that worked and what that process looked like. Um, on top of this, we've been doing some software development with our software suite Unidec, which kind of underlies all of this. I won't really talk about that today, but it's kind of the enabling technology that allows us to do these sort of crazy mass spectrometry analyses. So uh, today I'm going to start by talking about our work on membrane proteins and protein lipid interactions. And then the second part will focus on uh, viroporins. And again, if you have questions, just shout them out throughout the talk. Feel free to interrupt. Um, it'll be a fun discussion. So um, I think most of the stuff I'll be presenting today is unpublished, although the second half is on bioarchives. So um, should be some very new stuff, which is cool. So I think uh, in an audience like this, I don't need to explain why membrane proteins are important and all the interesting roles that they play in, in cellular function um, and the important pharmacology of membrane proteins as drug targets. Um, I'm sure you're also aware of the analytical challenges in terms of getting the membrane protein, uh, solubilizing it, and the fact that we need this lipid bilayer um, for often for membrane proteins to function. And I think this is something that my group was really focused on was how membrane proteins interact with the surrounding membrane and, um, trying to specifically dig in on kind of what the lipids around the protein look like, because, you know, most, uh, cartoons of membrane proteins show them in this kind of nondescript lipid bilayer, right? We have this sort of textbook image of identical lipids all stacked perfectly in order. Um, but real membranes are, are really far more complex, right? We have lots of different lipids, lots of proteins, all interacting. And what we really are interested in is kind of trying to understand, we know that the lipids can be important modulators of function. So we want to understand how they interact directly with the protein, right? Um, in various lipidomic studies, we can say that there, there are different changes in lipids. People have done some beautiful mass spec imaging where they see that lipids are very different in different tissues. Um, but what we're really interested in is what do these structural lipids and annular lipids around the protein look like? In other words, like how is the local lipid environment around the protein different than the bulk lipids that might be around it? And so we wanted to do this using a combination of mass spec and nanodisks. And the basic idea was, you know, what if we could just reach down into the membrane and yank out a protein and kind of see what comes with it? right? Um, very similar to a lot of the small studies that have been done, right? Um, we're just trying to do this in the gas phase rather than in solution. So um, the way native mass spectrometry works is that we take our, our sample, we put it in this electrospray needle, we put a voltage between the needle and the instrument, and we get these charged droplets that spray out, they evaporate, and then eventually we get our charged analyte that goes into the uh, mass spectrometer. And with conventional electrospray, we use fairly denaturing conditions. And this means that we get an unfolded protein that picks up a lot of charge. But if we switch it and use gentler conditions, so we use non-denaturing buffers, so water, neutral pH, uh, volatile buffer like ammonium acetate, we use gentler ionization conditions, we can keep this complex intact. And now we see we have a much tighter charge state distribution, much lower charge overall. Um, so what people typically do with membrane proteins is that they'll start with the protein in a membrane, they'll extract it in detergent, they'll electrospray that, and then they'll break off the detergent with collisional activation. And so this will take a kind of messy spectrum like this, where we have a lot of lipids or a lot of detergent bound to the protein. And you can kind of see it's pretty messy. Each of these is actually one little extra detergent bound. Um, and as we activate it, we can strip off more and more of that detergent until we're left with just this nice bare membrane protein complex where everything is well resolved. 
And detergents are great, of course. Uh, they're really effective at solubilizing membrane proteins. Um, they are pretty easy to remove in the gas phase as long as you have the right detergents. Some are harder than others. Um, but we kind of know now a handful of detergents that work really well and that are easy to remove. This means we can break off the detergent and keep everything else mostly intact. Um, and we'll see some detergent-based work kind of later in the talk. Uh, but you can see there's a couple problems here. One is detergents aren't real lipid bilayers. And so although you can add in lipids and you can see them bind, it's not really in the context of a lipid bilayer. And actually, you're going to see an example of why that's important um, toward in, toward, towards the middle of the talk. Um, the other problem is that, um, you know, like you can't really see a ton of lipids with this approach, right? You might be able to see some very tightly bound lipids, uh, but you're not going to be able to get to that sort of full annulus of lipids. So we're kind of limited to only lipids that outcompete the detergent because there's a lot of detergent around. So you're really only going to see, you know, sort of specific lipids here. And so to get around this, we wanted to look at some other membrane memetics. And of course, um, in a small journal club, you're aware of all these wonderful memetic options that we have uh, available. We like to use these nanodisks up here, which have sort of this 10 nanometer lipid bilayer and this scaffold protein wrapping around. The reason we like the nanodisks is that compared to all these other approaches, they're the most monodisperse, meaning sort of the least um, sort of size polydispersity. And they're also the most homogeneous in terms of um, having a very clean mass distribution. And that's, I think, one of the real challenges with the polymer-based uh, lipid nanoparticles is that polymer just has uh, such a complex mass. And the nice thing about a protein is that we can really precisely say exactly what we want that sequence to look like and get a really clean uh, mass out of it. And of course, we can put membrane proteins in here. We can control the lipids that go inside. Um, I like to, I used to make an analogy to a sushi, but now I changed this to a breakfast burrito. Um, just to give a little uh, different twist on uh, kind of how this all works. Um, so the way we make nanodisks are just by taking our scaffold protein and our lipids and removing the detergent that we use to solubilize everything, the sodium collate here, and this, everything kind of magically self-assembles. So we can take that, purify it with size exclusion chromatography. We also use the SEC as a place to switch the buffer into ammonium acetate. So it basically comes off the sizing column ready to inject on the mass spectrometer. And we're doing uh, everything today on a UHMR orbitrap mass spec. So what we get is something that looks like this, where we have kind of this beautiful distribution of peaks. Uh, for the mass spectrometrist in the audience, you can kind of see we have a different sets of charge states here. So we have the plus 18, the plus 17, the plus 16, the plus 15. Uh, it's Great looking data, but a little bit hard to get your brain around sometimes. So this is where we use our unit act deconvolution software, which kind of takes each of these overlapping distributions and just kind of slides them all together and plots it instead of mass over charge now is just pure mass, right? And what we see is that we have a lot of distinct peaks here, and each of these distinct peaks corresponds to a specific number of lipids per complex. So we see some pick up 159, some are 160, some are 161. We can really precisely say what this you know, mass and lipid count distribution is on the nanodisc. And overall, you know, this demonstrates this, this total number of lipids, this overall mass, that we can keep these nanodiscs intact in the mass spectrometer. And we worked on a variety of sort of little tricks to help stabilize things and prevent even the last sort of lipids from breaking off. So uh, when we put a membrane protein inside, things get a little more complex. Under the normal native mass spec conditions, we typically see that the protein falls out. And what we get is an annulus of lipids stuck to it, right? So this protein has a mass of about 96 kilodaltons. We end up with about 80 lipids bound, right? So it falls off with just a, a ton of lipids stuck to it. We can control this and by using different uh, reagents and solution, we can decide whether we want to eject the protein, which is keep the whole thing intact and measure the mass of the intact nanodisc complex. So this is actually a, a lipid resolved intact nanodisc uh, with a tetrameric protein, about 150 lipids and two belts. Um, and the cool thing is that we can actually tell what the oligomeric state distribution of the protein is inside the intact nanodisc without having to break it apart. And we're going to see towards the end of the talk where that's really cool. Um, and how we've been able to, to study drug binding in this way, which I think is super exciting. Um, 
But first, I want to talk about this idea of looking at lipid specificity. So what we wanted to do now, this was all done with a single lipid initially. We wanted to say, let's put in a mixture of different lipids, right? So let's say we put in a 50-50 mixture of POPC and POPE, right? And this is done with a trimer of uh, this AMTB, ammonium transporter from E. coli, right? So we take this nanodisc and we put it in the mass spectrometer and we basically break it apart, right? So we break the protein out and the goal is to see, you know, which of these two lipids sticks more abundantly because they have slightly different masses. We can use the mass that we measure, which is shown up here. This is the ejected mass spectrum. Instead of plotting it by mass, I've plotted it by number of bound lipids. So you can see this is the ABO protein broken out. This is one, two, three, four, and so on, bound lipids, right? And so what we can do is say, well, this peak here, this is 10 bound lipids. So let's subtract the APO mass, divide by 10, and that'll tell us the average mass of the bound lipid, right? So we're just measuring on average, what's the mass of the lipid bound? Because we know that if it was 760, that would indicate it was 100% POPC. And if it was 718, that would indicate that it was 100% POPE. What we see is really something right in the middle. And this is kind of what we expect, right? We made a 50-50 blend of POPC and POPE. We break it out we're basically seeing 50-50 lipids stuck to it, right? Um, it's, I would say for all of these peaks, it's basically within error. Now there is a subtle deviation here. Um, I would say overall, there's little to no selectivity for POPC over POPE, except for these few tightly bound lipids, right? You'll see that this distribution kind of ticks up and that indicates that for maybe five of the bound lipids, there is a slight specificity reaching maybe two to one at best. All right, you'll see this come back to play later. So then we did this with POPG and POPE. Again, now we, instead of having two very similar lipids, POPG has that anionic charge, very different sort of overall character. Um, we did the same thing, put it in the nanodisc, broke it apart, smashed everything and see what fell out we get kind of a very similar looking distribution of peaks. But now when we look at the average lipid mass, we can see it's heavier than the expected 50-50 distribution. All right, so we would expect it should fall on this line like we saw on the last slide, but everything now falls slightly higher. And what this is telling us is we're getting selectivity for POPG over POPE. And it looks at a, like about a two to one specificity, right? And interestingly, it's pretty constant from like, four lipids up to about 20. Um, it's, it's hard to measure these last few bound lipids. Those are the hardest states because the uncertainty kind of goes way up. So we usually just cut those out. Okay, so then we did- can ask, uh, Sorry, yeah. can I ask a quick question? I don't want to butt in, but um, no, what yeah. is the annulus, uh, the size? How many would you expect mm. and that they fit around it? About 80 lipids. Oh, many more, okay. Yeah, yeah many more. So this is, and we'll see an example here in a second. Um, yeah. This is done with basically just ejecting down to the sort of last most tightly bound set. Um, and we do see, you know, about like, I think the distribution even continues. I think we cut it off at 20 because um, maybe these, we, yeah, these really start to decay after 20. Mm. Um, but on this next slide, I think we see up to, yeah, up to 40. So we'll see typically sort of maybe a half annulus. Um, okay which kind of agrees with all the, um, I think it's similar to what we see for polar bound lipids. So in other words, of the annular lipids, only about half of them actually make polar contacts with the head groups. Um, there are a handful where the tails touch, but the head groups are kind of positioned away. And so I, I think it roughly correlates to that, but I'd have to go back to our, our paper and check. Um, okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. So anyway, um, this is the distribution now with um, a mixture of POPC and POPG. And what we can see is uh, the masses are, are different here. So that's why the distributions are kind of flipped. But overall, you know, looking at lipids kind of 10 through 40, we see again, the same sort of two to one enrichment in PG, slightly lower mass than we'd expect. Except as we get to these last few, like less than seven sort of bound lipids, we start to see the distribution flip. And now for these very tightly bound lipids, we get a, like a three to one enrichment in PC. So we're kind of seeing that these, these two distributions, there's one where we're like very tightly enriched in 
PC, but only for a very small amount of binding sites, most of the annular lipids are enriched in PG. And this kind of makes sense because PG is actually required for the protein function. We expected to see the PG binding. Uh, we did not expect to see this POPC binding site. And we're still trying to figure out kind of why that is. Um, but we can do this. Uh, this is kind of answering Frank's question. We can do this with a set of different experiments. So this is now with the highly ejecting sort of conditions. This is with the sort of partially ejecting conditions where we can see 40 to 140 bound lipids. And you can see in this range, it is enriched in PG, but it kind of slowly ticks back upward, right? So in other words, as we kind of, this is, I like to think of this as peeling an onion, right? Um, as, we, as we peel closer to the protein, we see more and more enrichment in PG until the last few little bits, and those are enriched in PC. And of course, uh, this is now done with the intact nanodisc, so not ejected. And we do see here that, you know, at like 170 lipids, which is kind of the max we can fit in the nanodisc, it's at the expected 50-50. And it's just as we start to sort of gradually peel this onion, then we start to see that enrichment, which um, I couldn't believe that we could do this. <laughs> when I saw this, I was amazed that we could string together this, this stitching of, of all these different conditions and really see kind of what you'd expect that it's like, it starts with bulk lipids. And as you remove them, they just sort of slowly build in specificity. And it's really only the last sort of 20 to 40 lipids where you start to see specificity. Um, so just to show this kind of all in one plot now, um, this is now the data with the PC and the PE, the first thing that we saw. And again, we saw mostly nonspecific with a little uptick. For PE, PG, we started to see that you know, strong specificity that was constant. And then with PG, PC, we saw kind of that bimodal regime where it was mostly specific for PG, except the last few that were specific for PC. And so I think if you look at these overall, what you can kind of see is that, um, you know, we have this picture now where of the annular lipids, most of them are probably PG, right? Um, there are probably a few very tightly bound PC. And you know, probably the rest are just kind of filled in with PE, right? So there's some where it's just PE because that's what's around, right? Overall, we saw no evidence for PE specificity, which I think is kind of interesting. So then our next thought was, could we do this from a ternary mixture, right? Where we took a PC, PG, PE through in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio. Now, the challenge here is that unlike the binary mixtures, we can't carefully um, figure out from the mass alone what the uh, composition is, right? We can measure the average lipid mass, but we can't say definitively what percentage of the different lipids that means because we have a three body problem, right? There's too many ways to solve that. Um, but what we can do is in light of that past data, we can see, does it make sense, right? Um, unfortunately, the average lipid mass is very close for a one-to-one-to-one -to, -one -to, -one to what we would expect for a two-to-one-to-one, -to -one, which it kind of like a two-to-one-to-one -to -one would be very similar to what we would expect um, assuming kind of that two to one enrichment of PG, it is consistent with the two to one enrichment. Um, but we can't really say definitively that it's enriched. What we can say though, is again, as we get below about six bound lipids, we see this consistent tick up. And that really, the only way we can really assign that is by assuming that we're getting now enrichment of PG, or sorry, PC in these tightly bound lipids. So I think we are seeing kind of the same story um, where it's consistent with an overall enrichment in PG for kind of the slightly less tightly bound lipids, but that this heavier uptick does suggest that even in a ternary mixture, uh, we do see PC specific binding for at least, you know, a handful of very specific sites. So we're working now to try and do some cryo-EM analysis on this and see, you know, can we find where these lipid sites might be? I think it'd be, I, for sure, the, the PC binding sites, I think we could potentially find, um, which would be kind of fun. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's pretty exciting that we can get this level of detail out of these sort of, uh, these sort of studies. And, and I don't know, I, I, from the beginning, would not have predicted that we could really see exactly what's happening. But I think it gives you, um, you know, a more nuanced picture of what these lipids look like around the protein that it's not just like certain lipids and certain binding sites. It's much more about sort of um, maybe sort of a continuous sweeping of different specificities, right? That we have different sorts of specificities in different sites and, and it's often not perfect, you know?
Um, so overall, we've seen that we can use native MS to find the oligomeric state in the bilayer. We can eject it to see what kind of lipids are around it. And that overall, this protein is mostly selective for PG, but does have some annular sites that are very specific for PC. And so I tried to create like a cartoon of what I envision this protein looking like, where we have a few very specific PC sites, um, mostly some slightly more specific PG, and then a few PEs just kind of filling in you know, at a few sites. So um, for those mass spectrometrists here, one thing you may be worried about, one thing we are definitely worried about is, you know, are these just gas phase artifacts, right? Uh, Cause this be just what lipid stick as we yank it out. And so what we wanted to do was come up with a solution phase way to kind of validate this. And my student James came up with this entirely on his own. It was a really creative idea of just taking some of his precious nanodisc samples. Uh, I would have told them this was crazy, but uh, he took his precious nanodiscs and he just started spiking in detergent. And the idea was, let's just disassemble the nanodisc and throw it right in the mass spectrometer. So we're calling this kind of like a flash extraction of just doping the detergent, release the protein and, and throw it right in the mass spec. Um, and so uh, this is a lot of data I'll show here, but I'll walk you through it. Um, basically we use two different very mass spec friendly detergents, C84 and Triton, which Frank was really one of the first people to try out, but as he knows, it's a beautiful detergent for native mass spec. Um, and interestingly, what we see, this is the, the gas phase data here where we ejected it. Um, I kind of flipped some of the plots so that it gives kind of a nice continuous distribution. Um, the C84 does show a, you know, a little bit of a, an enrichment in PG, right? Um, it doesn't show really much of any enrichment in PC over PE. Um, but we lose that uptick, right? We lose that uptick here, or, or in this case, so we flipped it, so it's a down tick, right? It's like totally consistent. And so it seems like CD4 is actually disrupting the PC binding site. And I say that um, because, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, there we go. Um, I say that because in Triton, we don't see that disruption. So in Triton, you can see now, this looks nearly identical to the gas phase data. This again looks very close to the gas phase data, although the C84 does as well. This doesn't look quite as specific, but we do see that same trend where it's overall enriched in PG down here and PC up here. So it seems like here that, that you know, we can get very complementary data out of the detergent extraction, but it has to be the right detergent. And I think this is something that we were, um, not really expecting. In hindsight, maybe we should have, but that the detergent can really affect which lipids are sticking to the protein. And so I think Frank had it right. Triton was the right uh, detergent to use. Quick question. Um, is it because detergent is specifically then competing with one type of lipid only? Exactly. Yeah. I think it's that the detergent is out competing one type of lipid specifically, or um, maybe it's Maybe it's out competing at that site that that lipid would mm -hmm. be specific for. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say, but I think it does, uh, it does indicate that you have to be careful uh, interpreting that data in terms of, and like for the conventional native mass spec where you're doping in lipids and putting in detergents, that the detergent is kind of an equal partner in that relationship. And uh, you'd want to at least try some different detergents and uh, yeah. perhaps try Triton as the first one. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we're excited about this. We're trying to, to write this up at the moment, but I think it'll be interesting to kind of put out there and, and see what people think. But I, the interesting thing about this flash extraction is it actually gives really nice data. Um, it's, it's much better resolved even than the regular uh, nanodisc ejection. We have done this now with the um, ternary mixture. So um, again, with the C84, we see it's kind of consistent. Um, we don't really see that same uptick that you'll remember from the past ternary data, but with the Triton, looks very similar to what we're seeing with nanodisc. So we're kind of getting a really nice agreement with the Triton and we're kind of losing some information with the CD4. Okay, uh, any questions at this point? We're gonna, I'm gonna move on to the last, uh, last part here. Um, sorry, I did have another one, and I'm not sure if you will touch upon this, but yeah. you've also worked with these really nice, more mixed um, nanodisks where you mm -hmm. have different lipids. Maybe you're coming to this now, um, but just a more um, simple question there. Um, did you find any compositions which the nanodisks don't like to accommodate or where they're oh, de yeah. or something <laughs> like that? I'm pretty I sure there will be. 
Yeah, we would have had that paper published a year earlier if all of the compositions we tried to <laughs> uh, worked. We found uh, by far the hardest lipid to work with is PE. And um, okay. POPE usually doesn't form nice nanodisks. It does with the protein, which we thought was kind of interesting. I would have told him steer clear of POPE, um, but he, he put it in and it made nice disks. So Do you think it's net charge or is it also the thickness that they're not compatible in a small piece of bilayer or what, what kind of factors might play a role there? Our thought is probably curvature because uh, PE is a very pro-curved uh, yeah. molecule. And what we see is that we can make nanodisc-like things, um, but they tend to have the wrong number of belts. And so what we think is happening is if you make a highly, like a, not even highly, but if you use a, like maybe a 20 something percent PC, or sorry, PE, maybe we were trying it at 50-50. For the, for the empty disks, what'll happen is you get three belts. And so the question is, are you getting uh, three belts because both sides of the bilayer are bent. And so now you have like much thicker sort of sides and you need three belts to stack it. Mm. Or are you getting some weird sort of like, uh, we, we sketched out this drawing where we had like basically like uh, like three duck bills coming together where you basically have a tri-layer rather than a bilayer. Mm -hmm. So think like here, here, and then here um, rather than like a nice bilayer, but like opening it like that and putting a, another segment here um, but then it's the planarity mainly, which is important here, not so much um, mm -hmm. charge repulsion or any other factor. Yeah, I think so. The way we solved it was by using uh, longer, like a slightly longer tail with more unsaturation. So we went from POP, POPE to SOPE. So like a 16-0-18-1 to an 18-0-18-1. Mm -hmm. And that, that fixed it. Um, okay. So it's quite versatile apart from that factor. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we also, I think with PG though, PG and SOPE still had issues. So we had to use um, fully saturated tails and that fixed it. So I think, you know, if you can kind of lock the lipids in place a little better, that also helps kind of flatten the bilayer out. Mm. Um, that's, that's our current working theory. But as I said, with the membrane proteins, that might also, like if you put a big protein in the middle, it might not care so much if there's just a little bit of bulk. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Cool. All I have right. one question, if I may. Oh, yeah, go for it. Um, what, um, does it matter what type of MSP you are using for your experiment? So we, for a while, were trying a bunch of different MSPs. Um, we tried some of the circular MSPs, but had some issues trying to get them to work. Um, we did a little bit of work with like the Delta 5 uh, version which is smaller and we got some really nice data with that. But um, we all of the protein work that we've done are with fairly large proteins. So we're using the E3 version, uh, the bigger version. Um, typically the E3 and the, the MSP1E3 D1 and the MSP1D1 are the two best. Uh, but I think the Delta H5 works uh, pretty well as well. Um, we'd love to get the circular going because I think there's a lot of advantages to that, but it's just been harder to work with and so we've mostly just kind of stuck with these for the time being while they, because they're working pretty well. So in terms of the release profile, they are all the same. Yeah, I would say fairly similar. Um, yeah, we were thinking we would see more differences, but there's really not too much. We did some work with uh, SAPIS and A, um, these uh, not quite the Pico discs, but um, like a, we were making slightly bigger particles than that. And uh, they give really nice spectra but they had uh, multiple different versions of the belt stoichiometry. So we'd see some with four SAP A, some with five SAP A, some with six SAP A. And so it's a little more complex to analyze when you have those sort of multiple distributions going on. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. These are great questions. It's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, we, uh, one of the things I didn't put in here because it's still very early is we've actually done this now with E. coli lipids. Um, and so Frank will appreciate we're doing charge detection to verify that we're getting good nanodisks. And we could actually use CDMS with the Orbitrap and see a beautiful intact nanodisk. Um, but you can't resolve any of the lipids until you start breaking it apart. But when you break it apart, we get really nice peaks of some very specific lipid bound.
Um, but we've got to figure out what that lipid is. And that's where we're at right now, trying to figure out how do we do um, some lipidomics to try and figure out, you know, it's not an obvious mass for what's bound. And so either that means we have a combination of things or maybe we have a non-obvious lipid. Um, but I think that's, we're trying to write up this paper with, with well-defined lipids, but I think our next direction is put in natural lipid mixtures and pop stuff out and see what, what sticks. Um, but yeah, like I said, we, we have a lot of work to do on the informatics side of, of, we can get beautiful data, but what does it mean is, is the main challenge there. So, all right. Well, uh, I, I'm excited here. I want to talk about some of our data on viroporins. Um, this has been a really interesting project. Of course, this is something we started at the beginning of the pandemic when you could only work on COVID stuff. And so it's, uh, but it's been really interesting and we've learned a lot along the way. Um, so if you look at sort of these different types of viruses, um, there's a, a lot of different structural diversity in terms of like whether they're capsid based or have these interesting structures. Um, but there's a fairly major cl class of viruses called envelope viruses that have membranes, right? Uh, they basically take a chunk of the membrane from the host cell and, and bring it with them. And these include a lot of important different classes of uh, human pathogens, including the coronaviruses. And so we thought, you know, there's, there's a membrane. We should look at what the membrane proteins are in there. Um, and for coronavirus, they have this envelope protein, which is the viroporin in, in what, one of the four proteins of the viruses. Um, for uh, influenza A, they have this protein uh, M2, which is a fairly well-studied protein, uh, otherwise known as matrix protein 2. It's kind of a, a pH-sensitive ion channel. So the idea is that as the virus goes into the, the cell, um, it'll go into the endosome, and then the pH drops. And so it's thought that that kind of activates M2, and M2 is kind of the pH sensor that then triggers the virus to fuse and uncoat and you know, release its cargo. It's also thought that M2 plays a role in kind of um, altering ion gradients and in, in helping to build the um, virus assembly itself. There's like, it plays a lot of different important roles. Um, it's been studied for a long time. And there's, you know, data back to the 80s showing that it's supposed to form a tetramer. Um, it's a clinically approved drug target for uh, two drugs, amantadine and romantadine. Unfortunately, both of these are no longer really that useful therapeutically because most strains, well, about half of all strains are resistant to these. Um, so there's kind of, you know, it's, it's a known antiviral target where we have drugs that should bind. We also know the mutations that are going to be drug resistant. So we thought this would be a really good system to kind of look at and try and understand this. We really went into it expecting to see this tetramer, right? Because if you look at all the structures, there are a variety of different orientations. There are a lot of different conformations going on, um, all in different kinds of lipids. So we see these are all like in lipids. These are in different sorts of detergents or short chain lipids. So we thought, well, there might be some interesting conformational changes depending on the lipid or some interesting differences in drug binding, whether we see one drug bound or, or four. Um, but what we didn't expect to see was this. So this is the data that we got. We get this really nice mass spectrum. It's a very clean sample. But when we deconvolve it, we get one, two, three, four, five, six for our oligomeric states, right? We expected to see a tetramer. All the structures are for a tetramer, and we get this polydispersed mixture. And so we thought, you know, is this perhaps more polydispersed than we thought? Um, could the environment be influencing this oligomerization? Maybe we just screwed everything up and we've done everything wrong and we're, you know, we should be getting a tetramer, but we're not. So we started to try a bunch of different things. We screened different pHs, we screened different detergents. Also some of the data here, just to kind of highlight how nice it looks. You can see this is a beautiful spectrum down here. It's almost exclusively a hexamer, right? Um, sometimes we get this mixture of different things, really nice spectra, but this is a polydispersed blend. Um, in this other detergent, this is octoglucoside at, at basic pHs, we get mostly dimer with like a few extra peaks for trimer. So we really kind of got things all over the map. And then we saw that it really depends on both the pH and the detergent environment. And so it can be either polydispersed or it can be in the case of like these two relatively monodispersed. We did see, you know, in one case with DDM at neutral pH, which is, you know, ironically, one of the conditions that gets used fairly often for doing structural work. Um, it was mostly tetramer, um, but we did kind of see other oligomers present there as well. Um, we did this, this is the full screen showing the different relative populations of different oligomers. Uh, 
as a function of different detergents and different pH. You can see Julia was hard at work screening a bunch of different things, thinking eventually we'll find the one where we have mostly tetramer. And uh, we really didn't see it. You know, the, the most monodispersed peak that we got was for this LDAO at pH five, where it was really mostly or entirely hexamer. Um, we did see some of these dimers. We did see some where we saw more preference for tetramers. And then for some, it was really very polydispersed, where it was pretty much an equal mixture of everything. And every time we measured it, we got a slightly different result. Um, we wanted to see the effect of pH a little more finely. So for in C84 here, we did a really careful pH titration from four to nine. We saw it really didn't affect it very much at all. In C84, it was kind of a polydispersed blend of everything. With LDAO though, we saw this beautiful pattern where from pH four to six, it was really nicely hexameric. At pH seven, it goes kind of all over the place. And then pH eight and nine, it switches and we're now getting tetramer. The few other things, but mostly tetramer. And then some like DDM, we saw kind of mostly tetramer and pentamer um, until we got up to above pH eight. And then we start to see uh, pH nine, mostly trimer. So it does seem that there are some pH sensitive switches in the oligomeric state in these different detergents. So then we wanted to do drug binding. And unfortunately, most of them didn't, we didn't see any evidence for drug binding. And I think the reason for that was that um, it's a very small drug, only 150 Daltons. And there's not a lot of chemical contacts to hold it on. And so because we're doing these initial studies in detergent, we have to activate it to break off the detergent. And I think that level of activation was enough to break off this small drug. But what we did see, interestingly, was that as we titrated in this drug, in a particular set of detergent conditions, this is C84 pH 9, we see it took this polydispersed mixture from you know, two through six into really very monodispersed tetramer. And so it seems that the, the drug is actually taking a, a polydispersed mixture of oligomers and pulling them towards a tetramer oligomer. Yeah, Frank. I wanted to ask earlier if the structures you um, cited for reference um, contained mm -hmm. among or what is the name again? Um, yeah. So they're all done with a drug present? Most of the structures were done, yes, with amantadine present, yeah. Which okay. it Interesting. does explain yeah. some of this, right? Um, yeah. But not all. That was uh, a point the reviewers made very clearly <laughs> in <the> recent <laughs> reviews of our uh, first attempt at the paper. Um, there are some structures without drug bound, but most of them really do have the drug um, because it's too... Uh, the signal does not look very good. It doesn't look very structured without the drug bound. And so our, our hypothesis is that, you know, it's probably a little more polydispersed without the drug. Now, I will say not all of the conditions showed the same effect. This is like a picking out a very specific set of conditions. Um, most of them really didn't show any changes. And I think that's because most of the detergents really drove the oligomeric state. Um, so if the other thing is that the drug does bind more under basic conditions, so we don't expect to see much change under the acidic conditions. Um, CD4 just happened, this is CD4 at basic conditions, so we should see drug binding, and it's also the most polydispersed. So I think it's the one where we would expect to see the, the largest sort of impact um, because it's probably the most oligomerically flexible. Um, we did repeat these uh, in the mutant form that doesn't bind the drug. And of course we did not see any changes, which is a nice validation that we are seeing something specific. Um, but the interesting thing was that the mutants did show a completely different starting oligomeric state. Um, and so we didn't go down this rabbit hole. Um, overall, the mutant does seem to show some differences in, in terms of the oligomeric state, but um, yeah, we didn't characterize that in complete depth like we did with the other one. Um, so then we wanted to do this in nanodisks. Now with nanodisks, it's a little more complex. Um, unlike with the AMTB, which is a nice solid large protein, it's easy to break out. Um, with the AM2, it's, it's very small, very fragile. And so to break it out of the nanodisk is kind of dangerous. We would be worried that we'd be breaking it apart. Um, so what we can do here is actually measure the mass of the intact nanodisk. And work out from a very precise mass distribution what oligomers we see in the intact uh, disk. Now, um, each time we add a protein, it shifts the mass by about 10 kilodaltons. So you'll see that here, we kind of, each of these peaks is up by 10 kilodaltons. It also subtly alters what we call the mass defect, which is basically how close is it to an exact integer mass of the lipid, right? 
So um, something that's you know just a ball of lipids will have a mass defect of zero. But as we add things in, it'll subtly shift the mass. And so we can use that as kind of a second dimension to visualize this data. Um, and what we see is we get a mixture when we put this in nanodisks of zero, one, two, three. This is in DMPG nanodisks. Um, when we put it in DMPC nanodisks, it's a bit messy in the data, but you can see we have uh, two, three, four, five, six, um, probably more two, four, and six than three and five. So we are seeing a little bit of a preference for the even states, um, but we're not getting in this DMPC a pure tetramer, right? We're getting a mixture of things. We are getting more incorporation than a DMPG, but we are seeing kind of uh, a couple different things going in. But when we switch to DPPC, so just adding two extra carbons in the tail, now we start to get a, a very clean blend of four and one, right? So we can see it's either monomer or it's a tetramer, uh, but we're not getting the same kind of spread that we are getting here. So it really does show that, you know, using the right lipids, we can drive it to form a tetramer. Um, now, what we could then do is start adding in drug. And these are the experiments I'm most excited about. So we could start adding this amantadine. And what we saw was when we added the amantadine, this distribution for the monomer did not shift, right? So the monomer doesn't bind the drug. But we see a nice shift here where this, this distribution doesn't really appreciably shift in mass, but it's just a, enough that we can pick it up as a subtle shift in the mass defect. And that this corresponds to 150 Daltons of binding. So this is now showing that we're getting the tetramer binding one drug. We also see a second distribution down here that corresponds to four drugs bound. And so this agrees with the crystal structures or the NMR structures where they can see the kind of two different states. There's one where the drug binds in the center of the channel, but at higher concentrations, we start to see drug bound between the different monomers um, at kind of these protein-protein interaction sites. And so uh, we then added even more drug, went up to 80 micromolar. Now we see we deplete the one bound state and we get mostly four plus four. And so I think this is super cool that we can basically see in a, an intact membrane, right? So we haven't broken anything apart. We have an intact membrane. We can tell you that there's a monomer and a tetramer and that the tetramer alone will bind either one or four drugs. So we can really get, you know, kind of this detailed stoichiometry information without having to break the membrane apart. Uh, and this is a really fragile protein complex, a really fragile drug interaction. We couldn't see in detergent, but we can actually see it now in the nanodisc. So um, overall, we've kind of seen that the pH can act as a switch to switch from this sort of larger oligomer into maybe a smaller oligomer. And that might be important in that role as it goes in the enzyme. So, you know, people previously did a lot of work on trying to understand the conformational changes and you know, a very subtle effect with the histidine in the, the active site of how that's affecting the gating. But we think maybe there could be another mechanism where it's just rearrangement of the oligomer based on the pH that could be affecting this. Um, we saw that in thinner membranes, it's a lot more polydispersed, but in thicker membranes, it really drives it towards much more monodispersed tetramer. Um, that as we add the drug that can take a polydispersed blend and bring it into a tetramer. And that as we add the drug, we can really determine the stoichiometry to say that it's first one drug binding and then four. So it's, I think, a really neat set of information. And I, all of this idea of kind of conformational rearrangement is, I think, pretty new to the field. Everybody kind of assumed it was a fixed tetramer. Um, the reviewers were maybe not, uh, not so excited to hear this uh, when we submitted the first draft of the paper. So we're working now to do some orthogonal confirmation to really show that um, what we're getting matches what's happening in solution. Um, but I think it's an interesting sort of set of hypotheses to, to expand upon. I think um, you clearly had the wrong reviewers there. We did. We uh, did not get any mass spectrometrists. I'm sure of that. <laughs> no, so, because it's such a dogma that structures should be um, fixed and ordered. And I think that's probably not true for these pore exactly. forming systems. I've um, speculated myself for some time because of P7 viral pore in hepatitis yeah. mm -hmm. it's been yeah. um, characterized in different stoichiometries and they're all published in good journals and they're contradicting yeah. each other. Yeah. And it's the same thing. Well, and they have, a, there's a review article that we looked at that has like a table of like, you know, all the different viroporins and all the, like their known oligomeric state. And I think, you know, maybe those are preferred oligomeric states, but um, I, even, I mean, I, even the mechanosensitive channel of large conductance was um, yeah. previously characterized with a long stoichiometry. 
Yeah, and that's actually one of our uh, one of our examples that we cite to say, you know, for these proteins where they interact kind of through one helix, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a lot of specificity you can get out of just that one interaction, and so you know that angle can open up a little bit to make a slightly larger complex. I think that's pretty reasonable, but um, mm-hmm. and you know, there's there's not really good techniques to look at a 10 kilodalton protein oligomerizing inside of a membrane environment, especially when we know that the membrane and the detergent can be very, you know, very controlling of that interaction. And to some extent, the helices take the place of one lipid. Um, so you're not even having much stick out or so, right? You're almost exactly. preserving the mass and density around that spot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So things like uh, we did some size exclusion chromatography to validate this. And we do see that um, in the conditions where it's more polydispersed, we get a broader sec peak. In the conditions where it's more monodispersed, it's a much tighter sec peak. Um, it's hard though to compare because the micelle size will really dominate exactly where it comes yeah. out. Yeah. Um, we're trying to do some cross-linking gels right now, but the problem is in SDS, it's a pure tetraver. And so what runs on a gel is, it's not maybe pure because the band is pretty broad, but it, it runs as a tetramer on an SDS gel. So we got to figure out um how to denature it and if you denature it and then put it on an sds gel it just folds back into something that's a tetramer um but we do see with some very preliminary cross-linking that um we get what looks like a hexamer band from that ldao ph5 so i think that's pretty cool we can basically deplete the the tetramer refolded tetramer and it, it will bump up to a hexamer so i don't know i'm hoping we can finish these experiments quickly and get it back out for review but mm-hmm. um yeah, I put you down, Frank. As, a, as sounds a exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I think uh, you know we've seen that we can use native MS in the nanodisc in kind of a unique way to look at these small oligomer complexes, and uh, that they seem to be very sensitive to their environment. And I think this has some, you know, potentially very interesting suggestions about how they interact within viruses and and new modes for uh, therapeutic sort of development and, and targeting and things like that. So. With that, I'll thank my wonderful research group, our great collaborators in our funding. And have any, if you have any more questions, I'm happy to talk more. It's been a great discussion. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. Did you consider just to get the virus membrane and mm. inject it into the, <laughs> some crazy stuff like that? Uh, I would say it's on our list. Um, yeah, not not live virus. Um, we don't have the clearance for that. Um, but um, there are these virus like particles. Um, and we have a few samples, but we've not gotten up the courage to put them in the mass spectrometer yet. Um, mostly because I'm I think it's going to be pretty messy and we want to try and work out how we're going to do that. Right. You know, um, it's a hard Actually, experiment. We are starting a project with AZ on adeno-associated viruses, they're still quite precious, but if we have some spare, then we could talk again, yeah. Yeah, we've, we've also been doing some AAV stuff uh, with the mm-hmm. CDMS, um, and uh, it's been pretty cool, it's interesting. Mm-hmm. We thought we just put out a Unidec for CDMS. Um, oh, perfect, yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, it lets you basically do CDMS on an Orbitrap in a reasonable way, so. Have you seen a new paper from Albertech with a pulse chasing or frequency chasing and where they get very high? Yeah, I saw that this week. Yeah, that could be really cool as well. Yeah, unfortunately, I think you need access to the transient for that. And um, they always make you sign a contract before they share anything. Yeah, I don't even think they let you see that. I think you have to send it to them and they'll send it back to you. Um, mm. So it's, uh, I mean, they also use it. I don't think we tried actually to see if our instrument could go to really long transients and it would not let us. So yeah, um, I think there's some special lockouts they have that you have to get cleared. Yeah. Yeah. yeah who knows? But I was also wondering, do you think this oligomerization profile is drug dependent? Mm. For example, if you screen for another drug, you will see yeah. probably tetramer as a major. Yeah, um, I think romantidine looks very similar to amantidine um, in structure. It's like actually as like one extra methyl or something like that. So I think that molecule would probably be the same. Um, but there are, you know, inhibitors designed to target the resistant form. And um, we've tested a few of those, but um, we've not seen much binding. So I guess I can't say 
yet. Um, but I think it, it could be a mechanism to think about um, drug developments to try and template a certain oligomer rather than like target a certain oligomer. Um, I don't know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Excellent. Cool. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, thanks. It's been a great discussion. Always fun to yeah. talk about uh, nanodisks and mass spec. And a lot thanks of unpublished lot. data. Thank you. Yeah. Good Sounds catching good. up and um, we'll be in touch. Yeah, cool. See thanks. you next week, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you, Michael. Bye. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.